Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Today's guest is Dee Eddington. Dee recently went on sabbatical to wrap his mind around all that's going on in the wellness industry in hopes of creating some order from all the chaos. In this wide ranging discussion, we cover everything from incentives to how we leave the employee out of wellness. God, we talk about everything. We talk about weight loss. <laughs> you name it, we talk about it. Now, as usual, D has some zingers in here. Like he calls out a few practices that are not helping us move the industry forward. If you've ever heard D speak, it's it's funny because he'll just out of nowhere call somebody out and it's it's, it's always very amusing to me. So he does the same on my podcast. Now, Dee and I start off by why he decided to take a sabbatical. We go in depth on how ROI, return on investment, is often misstated. And we talk about that pesky and pervasive program problem and why Dee thinks the answers are in the outliers. Dee uses a fantastic analogy where he compares wellness programming to breakfast cereal. It's good. I mean, it makes so much sense. It's, it's towards the end of it. And then he also mentioned that he he tweets. Very cool. He's very cool, right? He uses Twitter. You know, it's interesting because Dee's pretty adamant about not using financial incentives when it comes to wellness. And you guys know I couldn't agree more. Um, I've said it over and over and over. I'm not a fan of incentives. But that got me thinking a little bit, like, why is it so hard for us to give up incentives? And I also want to practice what I preach, right? So I don't, I don't want to just be on here saying you should do these things and that I'm not doing them myself. So for this reason, I recently ran an experiment, quote unquote, experiment with a client. Although I don't believe in incentives, the common thought at this company and this by this company, I mean, their employees is that people need incentives to participate, right? It's been part of the culture. And anytime a challenge is run, what do people get, Right. Last fall, we ran an exercise challenge and we had 333 people participate. So they didn't have to participate. It's not tied to any premium contribution, nothing like that. But there were some prizes offered. So typical exercise challenge, put out, hey, join this and you have the chance to win X, Y, and Z, got 333 people. This spring, I said, no, I'm not doing it this way. Let me practice what I preach. And collectively with the wellness ambassadors, a group that spans the entire organization across the the state, um, we decided not to advertise any prizes. So we just said, yeah, we'll offer some like lottery things, you know, raffles at the at the end of it or during it. We didn't want to put it out there because we didn't really want to influence people to participate just because of these incentives. You know, when you think about it, like why pay people to participate? Not only are you paying for this online challenge, but then you're adding in incentives. It's like, what's the point, right? But a piece of me was really nervous about this. We may get less people. Um, ultimately, I talked myself off the ledge and, ledge and said, forget it. It just doesn't make sense to offer people incentives. And so we, we're in week four of the challenge, three, week three of the challenge, and um, haven't given out a prize yet. So what was the result, right? And so we actually got 350 people to sign up and register. And that's actually more than with the incentives. So I was pretty excited about that and wanted just to to share that experience because I know that at least in my mind, it's common knowledge and common research that incentives are not going to change health behavior. I hope we all know that. And that's one thing, that's one piece, the knowledge piece, but actually putting that in place and having a little bit of worry and in fear that people aren't going to participate and then your numbers aren't going to look as good. And then what are people going to think, et cetera, et cetera. Just know that I put it in place. We got more people to participate, even though we are going to offer some incentives along the way, they're going to kind of be a surprise to them. So I want to make it a, you know, regular uh, priority for me to put these these little experiments in a client. So to know that I'm, I'm doing them too. And I get being a little nervous about it. But in the, in the end, it just doesn't make sense to pay people to participate in this because it's not going to do any good. It's not going to actually change your health behavior. All right. Uh, if you want some more support as you are 
maybe trying to change the way people are thinking around wellness at your organization or with your clients, come join us on Facebook. All you need to do is go to Facebook in the group section, search redesigning wellness community. I ask you a couple questions just to prove you're human and not a bot. Come join us. Um, We're a welcoming, supportive group of wellness professionals from across the US and beyond. We've got someone from Ireland and got some folks from the UK in there. So come join us. All right, let's go ahead and dive into this very wide ranging conversation with Dee Eddington. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Dee, welcome back to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. So glad to have you. Okay, thank you, Jan. I'm mean, happy to be here. Well, we talked quite a while ago, and, and you know, since then, you decided that you were going to take a sabbatical from practicing. I did. Yeah. <laughs> what What made you decide to do that? Well, I've been concerned about this uh, field for some time. Uh, not not that it's going bad. I think we're doing well. You know, sometimes you're doing well, and you don't notice what might be happening in the on the uh, other side. My initial uh, simplistic view of health is when I started in the uh, late 1970s. And I think uh, most people did. We have a very simplistic view that um, if you're not exercising, just start exercising. If you're overweight, just lose, lose some weight. And if you're not stressed, just go meditate for a while or, or uh, do something else. But I think eventually uh, we've learned about the complications of poor health. Uh, that health is not a simplistic uh, concept. It's very, uh, very complicated. And now uh, I think I'd like to see us uh, see some order uh, um, uh, emerge out of complexity. And that's a that's a simple way to say that, but it's very uh, uh, hard to do. I, I give uh, credit to uh, John Holland. Uh, he was a psychologist here at uh, at Michigan, and then uh, ran an uh, institute in uh, uh, New Mexico uh, about uh, emergence. And uh, he wrote a book uh, from order from um, emergence uh, from ca- emerging from chaos to order. I think um, I don't know if I'd say we're in chaos in this field, but uh, I was uh, worried that we were getting there. And uh, chaos is not bad. Uh, complexity is, I think, where we are. Not, we're not all the way to chaos. Uh, but uh, I'm worrying that, do we know where we're going? Uh, do we know where we've been, even? And so that's uh, uh, something I am concerned about. And so, I, do, do you think we know where we're going as a field and we're all going together? Uh, no. <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I started this sabbatical. I think that's a, a good question. Uh, I don't know if everyone, everyone, uh, anyone else would have asked that question, but I appreciate you uh, asking that because um, I think that uh, the way things are are going right now, uh, we we still have a um, idea about a single focus programs, and uh, I don't think they work very well because. Uh, we have a program about exercise, and we have a program about stress, and we have a program about a gratitude, and then we have a program about resilience, and we have another program. And there's a bunch of things to, uh, going on here. And then uh, it's, it's really uh, interesting to me uh, to look at uh, these different programs, and they all uh, show that they, uh, they, at least they try to show they're saving healthcare cost dollars or they're helping people to be more productive and, and better performance. And uh, I think they're all measuring the same thing. Uh, they've all, there, there is, so, there is a, a benefit. But they're all measuring the benefit and claiming it's because of our program. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, if you add all the benefits we're saving, to be much more valuable than having even run the program. Just uh, <laughs> run the company. Uh, 
And so it's a, it's a very uh, uh, complex issue, and I needed to get my head around uh, complexity. It's situational uh, as, as well, and uh, solving uh, complex issues uh, for organizational and human health, combinations of everything, physical, sociology, I'm reading about your physical, sociology, psychology, genetic, environmental, intellectual interventions. And um, it's going to be, uh, all those are going to be needed. And a complex issue just can't be solved by uh, looking at issues that uh, just are very simple. And you can't get main effects. We've been looking for main effects all this time. And I was, uh, I was uh, doing the same thing. And if we do, we did get exercise. And then we look at healthcare cost savings. So healthcare cost savings is the main effect. But between exercising and health care savings or any kind of savings, there's a lot of things that happen in between. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, can't, you can't just say that because they're exercising, they're saving so much money or they're saving a few hours or they're selling more product or whatever. Uh, it's, it's just not not possible. Uh, and I think people are, are uh, doing these programs without a framework in mind. I don't think they really know. I mean, they um, be in the whole field, not any one individual. Mm-hmm. I think, but I think that's the way it's turned out. We, we just, from one uh, year to the next, they, there's a new focus. Uh, this year, it may be culture. Next year, it may be resilience and next year it may be something else. So do you think this is the year of culture, the, the, the past year or two, or focusing on the talk about culture, but not really putting yeah, that, culture yeah. as a program maybe? Right. No, I think that's true. Just have to just go at it like this is the answer. And it's uh, what, what's the next best thing? What's the next great thing coming up? I was really, I'm still uh, really concerned about it. And then, really, do you just to clarify? So you're really concerned about just the the programming that we continue to put in as as wellness professionals uh, approaching yeah. it as, as a, from still from a programmatic standpoint. Is that what yeah. you're? Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Is that it's just one one program after another? If you have enough money, uh, that's okay. But I think many uh, programs are limited in resources. Mm-hmm. So they, can't, they can't put all those in. So they're going to have to have some framework to figure out what, what's the next thing uh, to do. So do you, what does it look like for you to be on sabbatical? Are you, are you, look, are you still on sabbatical? Are you no, no, well, Yeah, I'm still. I'm, <laughs> now. I'm into my 14th month. I was going to do it in eight months in the end of August. And I had, had good notes and I wrote it up in 10,000 words. And, and so... I decided I uh, couldn't do that. Uh, just I can't put out a 10,000 word unless I go forward to write a book. And I may do that, but I didn't. So I'm, I'm thinking that I'm putting this into five uh, different posts. And three of them are up right now on my, on anything associate blog. Right. So I remember when we first set this up, we were thinking you would be done by now. And <laughs> thank you for still having this despite not being done. Um, yeah. So yeah. I want to hear about these, these observations, but first I want to understand, you mentioned a bunch of different fields that you were reading from, but what yeah. does sabbatical look like for you? Is it, you have a few, like some big questions you're trying to answer, or do you just go deep into literature in, in, in various areas of study? Well, I, I did go into the literature, but I felt that that was, um, too much of a, as a research project would take uh, some time. And, and we had gone into literature with uh, Jennifer Pitts and I when we wrote the, the uh, Shared Values book. The answers I was, I was feeling uh, were outside of the field. Uh, we had so much uh, inbreeding thinking and we're into almost group think. We're all, we all know what we know. We're all talking to each other and congratulating each other on the things that uh, they were finding, we were finding the same thing. So I knew I had to do something different. So we did the, a lot of the research there, and that took uh, three years to do that book. And I had retired. We look into all the uh, 
work around uh, psychology and sociology and architecture and economics and everything we could find and help how to help us think about uh, a model. And we came up with a model. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if that's the right model. There's, there's many models out there. D, so it almost seems like that, that shared value, shared results was the, is the order out of chaos, but did you not feel like that was sufficient? Uh, right. I didn't. Uh, I think it was um, more of a companion with zero trends. Mm. It was more on the, um, well, almost what you might call the well-being side and zero trends was more focused on like traditional uh, wellness. I think it's all wellness. It all goes together. Um, but I think it was this different. In some ways, it added to my confusion <laughs> of, uh, of this because a lot of people had uh, jumped into well-being as a better term. And I think, um, I think they jumped in it for a lot of reasons. Some people really thought there was something there. Other people thought it was good to change the name and, and uh, get rid of the wellness field and move into well-being it sounded better so yeah. I think people were moving without total knowledge of what they were doing and so it was, it's easy for them to move into that and other uh, people thought well let's let's just go to uh, the other things around well-being as they're calling they were well-being uh, they're trying to integrate uh, positive psychology uh, from the University of Pennsylvania place where it started with Seligman and, and uh, Peterson. Mm-hmm. And then uh, also with the uh, positive organizational work here at Michigan in the school of business. And so those two together really will form some of the well-being things that we had, we had talked about. Not that I talked about, but what I put together as, as sort of the more, especially Seligman's uh, work. And, and uh, the work here with... Uh, the people at, at the in school of business, they were more in the organizational uh, uh, culture. You know, it worked together. We had them going. But either uh, Simon, you, they would work on their own. And the people at, at Michigan worked on their own. And they weren't cooperating either. I mean, they know each other and they were referring to each other's work. But they had their own business. And uh, I mean, not business, but their own economic, their own academic uh, uh, strain, so they were going on that way. So those were happening, and then uh, the, uh, they they came out in the late uh, 1900s, 1999, uh, 1998, all the way to you know 2004. That, that's when they came out, and then uh, 2010, uh, the Gallup people came out with uh, with their uh, well-being mm-hmm. uh, study. So all these things were coming on. Everyone was jumping on it, and and uh, uh, it just looked like there's almost a anti revolution going on in the <laughs> world. It's not. It's not good for us. I would do that. What, what do you mean? It's not good for us, D? What, what does that well, mean? Uh, because it it's um, it looks up like, like an infighting, and when I'm looking at this, I'll say these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, one person comes in and says one thing, and another person comes in and talking about uh, other programs. So it's not uh, helping. And then uh, Al Lewis and Robeson and, and uh, Ward were coming out with all the negative things about, about uh, uh, wellness. And well, and I don't know about they, they took on well-being, but they, they certainly were working on uh, wellness. So that was just about had enough. And then, and then the presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to do anyone in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would get out of bed in the morning because it's not going to happen in all these things going on. In addition, the consultants were out there uh, selling uh, these things on a very simplistic uh, view. And, and I thought there was some, I assume that they all had good, um, good frameworks they were selling. But when I investigated it uh, during the sabbatical, I thought they, I found that they weren't selling any foundational things. They were just selling programs. Like benefits consultants? Yeah, benefits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're dangerous. Uh, not all of them, but they, were, they weren't uh, promoting uh, well thought out initiatives. It's just routine and simplistic 
selling the same thing to one program or another. Yeah, well, that's some somewhat uh, somewhat negative. On the other hand, we were doing quite well. <laughs> Wellness has done terrific in 40 years. Look how far we've come. So let me go back to something you said earlier, and yeah. then you you were talking about er, earlier in in the life cycle of, of wellness. I don't know if you the thing I said you said it was the 90s. Everyone was kind of in the field. Of, everyone was group thinking, if you will. So right. just everyone right. pat each other on the back. Yeah, you're doing great. You're doing great. And then obviously there was some uh, differences of opinion in in the wellness industry leaders you know, recently, right before you went on on sabbatical. (laughs) So where's the balance, right? We can't have everyone patting each other on their back thinking, you know, exactly the same. And then you also can't have people like just viciously going at each other. So is there a balance between group think and then just the uh, wellness infighting? Well, I think there is. And that's where I've uh, come to. And that's where I'm uh, in this uh, fourth and fifth uh, post. I think if I look at it, I think the uh, what we might call the, the uh, well-being side, if, it, if it's, it's an artificial uh, separation. But if I look at that and, and I look at people talking about the resilience and uh, gratitude and compassion and all the things that uh, work in the organization, and they're getting some good results. Uh, Cameron uh, and uh, his, a group there. They're getting good results on, on companies. And I think about uh, what Seligman's doing and uh, the BAI and Peterson called the values in action. He had helped design that, but he passed away last year. But they have a lot of good following. And uh, I saw where uh, Yale is just offering that course. And it's the most subscribed course in the history of Yale. Which course is this? Uh, well, it's called Happiness. If they're doing a positive psychology course, and the uh, undergraduates are signing up for it like crazy, they never never had a course that had so many people in it. So it has a lot of uh, credibility just by the title, and you know, all the positive psychology is. Psychologists are happy now that there's something positive going on, rather than all these negative things about psychology. I think they come out with a. Uh, I mean, they're they're trying to work into healthcare costs, but what the real value is in the positive attitude of people, and where they're going to be uh, get rid of some of the bullying and and all the harassment that's going on. Uh, if they train people uh, to think that way, uh, as anti that, that could be a major contribution to com- uh, companies. If your um, program is developed on the values that people have. The company has values and the people have values. And where's the combination? Where's the, the uh, culmination? Where do they overlap? And that would be you could source you could build your, your uh, uh, program on. And then they also uh, have raised all. What do, they, what do the people want? What does the company want on the wellness? And what does the employees want? So instead of going right in and, and putting a program together, you look at the values. And if the values are related to uh, relationships and uh, better uh, ways that we talk to each other and a better culture, then maybe you should be focusing on those other, those other uh, those courses of uh, compassion and uh, resilience and the mindfulness. If your values and results, desired results, are related to healthcare costs and absenteeism and so forth, maybe you should be working on some of the traditional wellness things. Uh, wellness gets in distress and it gets into relationships, and but also it gets into exercise and weight loss and so forth. And those have more impact in, on the cost side in medical. If a company says, here's our values, then as a, as a wellness director, you could say, well, okay, well, we'll put 60% of our, car, our courses into at, uh, programs that relate to those values. But we'll also keep 40% to relate to healthcare costs because that's always going to be a uh, – every company always has healthcare costs into what they're solving. 
But if it's the other way around, if the company says, we're really under strict, we've got to go to healthcare costs, but you could convince them that maybe the culture has something to do with it too, or the, the attitude and, and relationship. So we'll put 80% onto, uh, into exercise and weight loss of our courses and 20% or 40%, 60-40 maybe, into the culture. Well, I think you can start to put a balance of the courses. So I think that's what I heard you say is, is there a balance in the courses? Uh, and that relates to, but I think it relates to the, the um, results, the values of the company and the results that they, that they want to get a, get a handle on. But they can't do it just by themselves. I think that's one problem that we've had. They, we've been doing everything for the company's benefits. We haven't been factoring in the employees' benefits as much. So, yeah. so let me stop you real quick. I've got a bunch of questions. So yeah. what I heard you say, and so I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, is mm-hmm. that if they wanted to go towards cost savings, then wellness programs would be a sufficient solution. Right. Is that, is that a correct yeah. statement that I just... Yeah, I, I would, I would uh, lean. I would never go 100% and 0%. I would say that we should go maybe 80% with the wellness programs. But the other programs work, uh, but I don't think they'll impact healthcare costs as much as the other, so more traditional wellness. And it's, but it's that, okay, can, that continues to be a struggle for me because I haven't really seen yeah. that the, the data to prove that wellness programs do provide this cost savings without yeah. disease management component in there so am i wrong feel free yeah. to tell me i'm wrong because oh no i i, I put disease management in as, as wellness programs uh, anything around disease in medical is uh, in that side so you would cont- okay so would you i don't know i guess where i struggle there is the it just it, wellness being a, a health um healthcare cost containment strategy. It just feels mm-hmm. like that medical model is outdated or well, not benefiting the employee as much as, as maybe the company instead. So it still, it still feels a little bit like in the, what well, we we're doing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's because that's, we, we've talked to management. The consultants have talking to management and everyone, you know, what, what does management want? So we always, always work towards that. And, uh, and maybe that's where the employee, um, employee feels left out of that. You, the, man, the employee says, you mean I have to do these things so managers will save money? And so we haven't, we haven't got the employees on board at day one. Uh, we go and, and analyze, and I, I work with a lot of unions, and unions are used to this. They, they say that uh, you know, management is what, it, what this is all about, and and uh, we have to do something to you know, help management make more money. And you're thinking employees that feel that way at some point about, uh, about wellness as we've, we've done it. Uh, we, we sell to, the programs are sold to management. They're designed by the program with, in relation to management. They're evaluated uh, in terms of what management wants. Report goes back to management. And they, of course, then the, the providers say how good we've been. And so, so I think the the uh, employees have just been left out of, and uh, way too much in this field that they they have no voice. They feel, and if you want somebody to be, participate, you need to get them involved early. You can't go in there, design the program, and then say, "Here's what we're going to do," and uh, without so they don't have any voice it's in any 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 kind of relationship. Right, right. Or the traditional model is giving them incentives to kind of, you know, get them to participate, which no. we, we don't have to go down that track. I've got another no. question. No, I, I have a it? major feeling against the financial incentives. Talk, well, I do have one more question, but go ahead and let's get into no, the financial no, incentives. No, go ahead. Okay. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, you made a comment when we were talking um, about weight loss programs. And, and you, you may be just been abusing that as an example. Yeah. Uh, there is a famous quote from you that you, yeah. you say yeah. that you know, focusing on weight loss programs are, is money down the toilet. 
Yeah. Do you and, still feel um, that way? So I just want to make sure that statement yeah. that you, you, you said. Yeah. Uh, John Robinson says that all the time, I know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I know you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch out for these quotes. Eh? You never yeah. know when they're gonna show up. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't recall that. <laughs> it, it is. It is in history now. So yeah. I mean, do you oh, want to? Yeah. No, yeah. You want to speak to weight loss programs and, and the, yeah, I think the, okay. the way we were were doing it was uh, probably somewhat a waste of time because uh, people going in a in a sixteen week or eight week course and uh, you we get people. Uh, they do lose weight, and there's no question about it. And I had a program that uh, taught me that it, it was General Motors. The uh, vendor was doing weight loss programs, and he was claiming and they were claiming all the the weight loss. But we were doing the the uh, evaluation at the end of the year, and there was no weight weight loss, and because they, they weighed it right back. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it has to be. This is something that's like an addiction. Addiction. You never uh, get there. You try. You can get to the, the your goal, and most people can get to the goal, but then they can't maintain it. Uh, so when they don't maintain, so the the weight loss programs have to be reorganized to some extent to say this is a very long term goal. And you're not coming in here to lose 10 pounds. You're coming in here to not lose weight first. You just don't get worse. And uh, if you you go with that in mind, everybody feels really good. I can do that. I can not gain any weight, but I have to lose 10 pounds. And so that's a, it's a, a, well, that's a poor design to say you're going to lose 10 pounds. 10 pounds is a big number. Uh, maybe lose two pounds. And uh, if, you, if you're going to lose 10 pounds, you're going to have to do it fast. And then the, the faster you lose it, the faster it comes back. So Yeah, I like what you said about just don't worry yeah. about weight right now. Like it's not yeah. as important. Well, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I said that a couple of times and some people got really mad at me because they like, you got you to gotta lose weight. That's what it's all about. I said, well, you don't understand mathematics, do you? If you're gaining weight, how can you start to lose weight? You have to start stop gaining it first, and then you lose it. I mean, it just follow the curve, and it goes up and it goes down. So there's one point where you're you're not you're not gaining or losing. You're just sort of even, and then you go down. So it, it's uh, mathematically, but it's a, it gives people an idea that they can do that. You know, but I say if you don't. Lose, don't lose weight. Uh, just stop gaining weight. But I don't mean stop gaining weight for a day. I mean stop gaining weight for like two or three months. Just stay there, and then we'll start to drop weight. Anyway, it, it's weight loss is a very very complex issue. Absolutely. And, talk about talk about like complexity, right? We've yeah. talked about that is a, a complex issue that we're trying to solve in a very basic basic way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for indulging me and in, in, in going down that path. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let, let's, let's talk financial incentives. You said you have a very strong feeling about them. Well, uh, people that put in financial uh, situation, I think we're lazy because we had started a long time trying to find the right way to motivate people. And so finally somebody said, well, let's just pay them. So they, you, that means that they think they can buy health and buy weight loss. I can buy you. I can, you know, I give you a hundred dollars to lose two pounds. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, I get an idea that one of the big uh, owners of a company here, um, big company, said to, to his vice president, who was way overweight, he said, "You lose a hundred pounds, run a marathon in a in a year, and I'll give you uh, ten thousand dollars." So he did, and. And he lost a hundred pounds, and he ran a marathon. Uh, not easy, uh, but he did it. Now for ten thousand dollars, I think most people would at least try to do that. Uh, Where is he today? With um, is he still uh, at that same weight today? No. <laughs> a year later, he, he he wouldn't get all the way back to hundred pounds overweight, but he would. And he got way back to maybe fifty pounds overweight. So. Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't uh, change that fast. You, you're uh, 
brain doesn't switch that fast. Uh, we used to think, yeah, you know, just calories in, calories out. And I was part of that um, feeling uh, there for a while. Uh, but um, weight loss is more than just calories in, calories out. Mm-hmm. Think about it. If you have more calories going out and, and less calories going in, you would um, lose weight. Now, it's, it's, that's not the bi- biology doesn't work that way. It's much more complicated than that. But it was a nice way to sell it. Nice way to sell uh, diets. Nice way to sell exercise. So uh, diets have uh, all you know work on the calories. And now some of them are starting to work on other things. But right. Yeah. Uh, the, the financials. I just don't think that's uh, that's the right thing. And. and uh, I see some of them don't don't add the the financial incentive into if they're doing an ROI study, they don't add that in, which needs to be added in. Yeah, and, and are you? I'm sure you are. You, you've you've seen this um, study that just that just came out recently on the um, has it University of Illinois employees uh-huh. did one year of the uh, the wellness program and it's not showing any cost savings. Do you know which article I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, I don't think wellness uh, is used a lot. So what is the wellness program first? And, uh, and so well, people say wellness doesn't work. And I said, well, that's impossible. Well, tell me what, what do you mean by wellness, first of all? Mm-hmm. And then what do you mean by does it work? And so uh, – if your person does a wellness program, uh, most of the time people say, I feel really good. Well, that means to me, that's means it's working. Uh, but if you say work in terms of dollars, yeah, it may not save dollars, but it worked in other words. So that's, that doesn't work in dollars. That's the management issue. But it doesn't work in human feelings, feeling better. That's the employee's uh, outcome. So, uh, it's it's a nonsense syllable, not nonsense saying to say wellness doesn't work because at first of all, people are not always measuring the same thing on wellness, not even trying the same thing. The components are different. Some were lasted, you know, three weeks. Some were where uh, uh, wellness uh, uh, lunch and learn for three weeks or five weeks. Other ones have a full blown program, and then uh, the wellness works for some people when all of our studies were were not just who participated but of, of all the ones that participate or didn't participate who made changes and it, regardless of how they made changes we counted them as as working and then ones that didn't make changes then we counted as ones that uh, didn't work or just and, and we did the analysis so we measured all the ones that worked and they, when they uh, did things, it, it worked for them, even on the financial side. And it almost always works on the, the uh, feeling better, although some people say, uh, gee, that felt so bad, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, yeah. It depends what kind of program it is, right? I mean, and there we go again with the programs. It really depends. Yeah, exactly right. That's, that goes back to the program. Right. They want people to run it. They didn't run it for the... Uh, for the best, the athletes. So there's, a, there's an athlete in every program compared to others. So I, I've had so much. I've had a lot of issues around around that. Around financial incentives, yeah. or around and another another um, issue. I mentioned uh, you know, every program, if it runs by itself, uh, is uh, is successful. Uh, but when you add another program. It may not be successful. It may be a negative. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, if uh, it, it's it's like a, a cereal. Kellogg's went, uh, had a product. Uh, had a product, uh, like a healthy product, a uh, uh, cereal, and they run that prog- uh, What they call the well-being or wellness uh, product, and they run it, and they make a lot of money. They're selling a lot of product. So they put another one out. The other one uh, just cannibalizes the sale of the first one. So the first one goes down in sales, and the second one goes up in sales. But the amount of money, set, amount of money made is no different. They haven't added anything. 
So if you had one wellness program working and it's working, but you had another one, uh, it, it, it goes down. So we don't know. I forget what the question was. Uh, we don't know uh, what's really working. And that's another problem that, uh, you know, people just add programs and add programs and add programs. Uh, if we count up all the money that people say they made uh, for their program, it was uh, like we talked before, it would just be astronomical, It'd be more money than, uh, than the whole company's uh, costs. Right. Right. I'm, I'm a fan of just divorcing it from cost and, and cost yeah. savings. And uh, I know some people think that that's probably ridiculous that you've got to show some kind of return on investment, but I'd have to say I've worked in corporate and there's plenty of initiatives that um, have a lot more money poured into them and don't have the same standards held to their program on return on investment. And I'm a fan of if your employees like it and it makes uh, the, the company a better place to work, Oh yes, right, exactly. That is enough of a success. So I just, yeah. uh, I think that's where the blending comes in. You have to put uh, some of everything, but it, it depends on your resources too. Like if a wellness program, a well-being program, whatever I call it, wellness programs. If if um, if they're strapped for money, each program costs you something, and so you have to figure out where's the best place to put the, the programs right right and that's definitely understanding you know i said that but understanding what you're trying to accomplish is always number one and yeah. is the program yeah. accomplishing that yeah. that's enough of it for me but um yeah. yeah you gotta know what you want from even putting it in in the first place yeah. well then that's an i guess another issue um who is it how do how do uh, programs get focused uh some programs are Focused for because what manage to uh, please management. Other programs are focused on what the consultants tell you, and other programs are what you know as a as a wellness uh, professional. And uh, maybe the uh, answer is uh, what do the employees want? Well, what what's their goals? And I think we they started we hit on this before, uh, but it has to be. You don't run it. You can't run a program for the consultants or run it for management, or even run it for yourself. It has to be a combination of everyone. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people, uh, you know, think they know everything, and uh, they run it according to. I'm the director of this program, so I'm going to, you know, say here's what we're going to do. Yeah, they don't know what they need. I know what they need. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, and I think they've got a lot of that happening. Yeah, all this is leading into the idea of chaos. <laughs> right. So, did, did you figure out some some order from this chaos? Like, what were your? Uh, and I'll, I'll link up the the post I've read, I've read one, but not recently. Um, what yeah. What were your key findings, if you will? And where do we go? Well, we'll, we'll go with key findings. Yeah, I've uh, in my um, the fourth one I've done. I have uh, fourteen uh, points where I think uh, uh, we could make some uh, difference. And the fifth one is going, I'm going to uh, put it all down in, in uh, where I really think it is. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of good things, uh, but some people are not doing a lot of good things. Um, so in the, in the um, senior leadership, if I just go to the, use the uh, five, Points of the of the uh, gets this book or the uh, zero trends book, uh, the five pillars. Uh, if I look at senior leadership, some people are just taking senior leadership uh, as as the rule and not having any kind of of uh, dialogue uh, with uh, other senior leaders and some dial no dialogue. Excuse me with uh, employees. Uh, and then they take that and, and run with it. The senior leaders, another uh, example is the senior leaders will, will be there for the first meeting and then never show up again. And they think that they, they've done it, they've done their job, and they've put in a, put in a, a letter and so forth. So people are not holding the senior leaders accountable 
uh, that their job is not finished just by saying saying something. And um, and then that, that quote's being used for a year, and then they come back and say something else. Uh, so I think that I think everybody agrees senior leaders are important uh, to be uh, supportive, but I think they they let let them off the hook, and maybe they feel intimidated by the senior leader uh, or any of the senior leaders. Uh, so the ways that they need to keep the senior leaders involved and tell them right from the start, look, we're going to do this, but you're, you're going to have to have either someone in charge, uh, one of the senior, one of the senior in the senior leadership team, one of them have to be responsible for this program or all of you have to, maybe each, each one of you take um, a phase uh, either uh, one person's uh, ex- really likes to exercise and you can be a, consultant on the exercise, somebody else can be a consultant on weight loss, somebody else can be a consultant on compassion, someone else on resilience. I mean, there's ways to keep them involved. Well, it does take a lot of um, courage, though, to tell your senior leaders, hey, you, you, got, you got to show up here. Like, that, yeah. that would be bold. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it does. Uh, but, yeah, if, if they're not willing to do it, I think you're better off to just get out of it because you know, you're going to be getting not the same thing that we, we, uh, and we got, if you do the same thing over and over again, you get the same results over and over again. Uh, you're insane. They have to have idea of this is a complex thing. This is not just a simple thing. of going to do weight loss and they had to be motivated. So motivation is what you're doing as a senior leader. You're motivating people. Because you're out there, and and people have a have a habit of of doing what the senior leaders are talking about, and to, and if if we if we can't get you out there, uh, their motivation is going to go down, and either that or you're going to going to try to buy them away, buy their them, and leaders are used to using money to buy what they want, but. That doesn't work with motivation when you change in a person. They need to, in, inside, inside of themselves, have to motivate themselves. And they'll motivate themselves if they see you out there. So that, that's one thing I have. Uh, that's one of the uh, 14. And I don't go into all those detail in here. Uh, I just list a couple of examples. And were these 14, do you feel like these 14 points are going to be a little bit of order? Like, did it help you with the rectify it in your mind a little well, bit, the, the chaos? Right. Yeah. Well, and then I have another um, another nine for the next, um, for blog five. So there's 24, uh, thereabouts, 23, 24, 25 points. And yeah, it is. And that, that's the order coming out where we can see some things that, we can do and and trying to eliminate some of the uh, confusion, trying to eliminate uh, just throwing one program after another. And uh, and there's a saying, all that glitters is not gold. So we we have a tendency to go for the program of the, uh, someone comes out with a new book and that's a new great idea. We all then jump into how do we do purpose now? How do we, whenever we're out resilience now, and all these uh, programs that come out in new books and, and the authors uh, up there saying how great it is trying to sell books. And uh, that's really, um, I find it would be very uncomfortable for me to do that. And I haven't been able to do that. But So do you, where, where do we go from here? <laughs> like where do we as a profession go from? Well, the, uh, the order that I put it in, in my mind, and I can just say, uh, I've, I don't think, I don't want to be someone uh, like, where do we go from here? Although I am trying to do that, but I don't want to be someone that's predicting what next year is going to be. You know, where, where are we going? Um, I think that's, that's always a bias thing. And if I want to know where we're going, well, ask me next year, where, how, how do we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. like the predictions of where we're going either. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, uh, 
and having a purpose or having a goal is a good, but the goal changes, the purpose changes, and, and the mission changes. So we have to be on alert to see where, where's the program, where the people want. And um, I know that uh, Charlie Estes, uh, he worked at General Motors, and he was trying to get people to exercise and so forth. So finally he says, we're going to have uh, get, in, get in shape for deer hunting. And people flock to that course. <laughs> here. So fly, deer hunting is a big thing here. And so he started in September, getting him ready for the November uh, start of deer hunting season. And so you got to get people wherever they are. Um, and, and, you know, that, it's an exercise, but it's not the kind of exercise that people usually uh, run, either running or mm-hmm. weightlifting and so forth. So I think it's getting order. I don't think there is any one order. I think you have to, with the complexity – or chaos even, uh, you have to look at it uh, little by little. And another thing I've been upset about is all quantitative uh, statistics. Because I think quantitative statistics operates on the, uh, the it's a uh, normal dis- distribution. And all, all of our data are not normal. <laughs> They're all skewed. Uh, but we still use quantitative statistics. Uh, we I violate many of the of the uh, rules for quantitative statistics. The quantitative statistics, I think the answers are in the outliers. Who are the ones that are really out there? Uh, and that that's where we have to figure. And most of the time in quantitative statistics, they throw out the outliers. They're throwing out the the uh, answers. So who are the people that are leading the, the flock? They, what I call the, you know, the next generation or that next out, just the outliers. Uh, they're going uh, beyond uh, where other people are. So how can we turn uh, the mean into the next generation, into the outliers today? Mm-hmm. Instead of playing for the averages. Yeah. And we have to, we got to get there. But I think I'm, I'm uh, leaning much more to qualitative uh, work now. And uh, uh, it's, it still can be statistical. Uh, but qualitative, uh, you ask people, you know, some different kind of questions. I think that's where we, we go to go because people are not quantitative necessarily. They're more qualitative. You make decisions on a yes or a no almost, not, right. not a statistical uh, analysis. I think... Uh, qualitative is is where I would like to uh, see us do much more in that, and and um, uh, all these things will, will can be qualitative, and you get people's feelings, and I hate it when people say, "Well, um, I don't like that program because you just ask people their feelings," and uh, when they don't realize that they make a lot of their decisions based on feelings <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Instead of all, like hard all, you're right. Exactly right, Dan. But they don't want to think that or believe that, right? <laughs> they yeah. want to think that they're making logical decisions, which we know we all yeah. don't make. Yeah. Well, a blood pressure is real. It's a real number. Yeah. Well, yeah. you take your blood pressure. What time of day do you take? <laughs> exactly. Who's taking it? What happened right before it? Right. Yeah. Right. So that that's really is uh, uh, something. Well, the good news is, I think is that we are. Uh, making progress. I think the uh, uh, wellness field, uh, wellness was a very fluffy word when I started, when, probably when you started, maybe maybe not by then. But uh, it was a fluffy word in health promotion. That was a, a real word that we're using. And, uh, but now uh, wellness is all over the world, all over the country. It's, it's, it's the United States. I don't know about the world. But it, it's, a lot of people are, are you know, taking off on wellness for other things, but uh, wellness is now a serious word. And, and uh, 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 that's a big growth, and that's only happened it took 40 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was a, a big bubble. Uh, the growth rate is, is great. I worry about it to, that it's a bubble and that we're getting people. Re- uh, we have a lot of credibility uh, on uh, instinct. People just feel like it's the right thing to do. 
you can't, no one argues about wellness as the right thing to do, uh, unless you're a qualitative uh, thinker and, you know, but I know that people, when they make changes, they save money and they feel better. And uh, if, if you just say all the people that participated in the program, if that's the goal, if that's the, the group you're looking at, you, you're never going to get them saving money. That'll never work because a lot of people in there don't, didn't say they, they didn't do it right. It wasn't the right program for them when the right series of programs. Uh, we can't just do it on one program and the same people have to be in all the programs if you're going to look at, at any of that. Uh, but overall, I think we're we're still in business. Getting bigger and bigger is you probably know much more about that than, than I do. There's more and more programs out there anyway. Right. And I think you had a head on some, you know, some good, good points, just like what's happening today. And I can't imagine what your sabbatical looks like and is still looking like to try to frame some kind of, not really framework, but points out of this because um, yeah. it is a little chaotic. And I think sometimes it's okay for it to be chaotic. Cause then it gets oh, yeah. to that next no, no. point, right? Chaos, chaos is good. The whole world's in chaos. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm just always glad that you you share your wisdom w- with the rest of us, and you know uh, I'm looking forward to reading these uh, articles four and five. Indeed, do you put them on LinkedIn as well, or do you put them on your? Um... Yeah, no, I put them on. Uh, I do a, a short tweet, of course, and then I do it. Of course, <laughs> and, and it's on uh, Facebook and it's on uh, my website. Okay, well, I'll get those linked up in the show notes. And yeah. uh, yeah. it's always a pleasure uh, to. Oh, to- yeah. I appreciate it. I, mean, I don't know if you can make sense out of all. I, I did a lot of uh, wandering around. <laughs> hey, that's always good though. We don't need to see, we don't need to stay on a linear path, right? We can have yeah. a chaotic interview. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's right. If you, uh, if you can make any sense out of this, that's great. Uh, you get bonus points audience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.